there's a woman who's a member of the Jane Street Church named Sarah Beto, who was as godly and saintly a woman as I've ever known. Sarah always had an encouraging word. She loved working with children. She never seemed to grumble or complain. Was a faithful supporter of the church. Several years ago, Sarah was diagnosed with cancer. She fought the cancer valiantly, but it continued to spread. Eventually, she had to have her left leg amputated, continued to fight it. It became difficult for Sarah to attend church regularly because of the chemo treatments up and her immune system would be low and have problems. And also when you only have one leg and you live in uh, north country like I do in the wintertime, it's snowy and difficult and hard to maneuver the wheelchair and so forth. But Sarah was in church the second Sunday in January when I happened to preach the particular message I'm going to be sharing with you tonight with a few minor changes. And following the service, as the congregation went out, I stand at the back and, and I shake hands. And as Sarah's sister, Julie, wheeled Sarah out and I shook her hand, she said, I want you to preach this at my funeral. And I made some kind of a light remark. And she said, no, I'm serious. This is what I want you to preach at my funeral. And so when Sarah died in May and lost her battle, this is what I preached at her funeral. Not my normal funeral message, but expression of Sarah's hope. And I believe an expression of the hope that you and I hold dear. You know, the old spiritual says, nobody knows the trouble I've known. You ever feel like that? Had so many problems, so many difficulties, nobody understands. Probably nobody had more of a right to sing that song and say those words than old Job. In a very short time, Job lost all of his possessions. If that wasn't enough, then all of Job's children died. And if that wasn't enough, Job was struck with painful sores all over his body. And in all of that, Job did not deny or curse God. But he certainly had great despair. In the midst of that desperation, Job despaired of life itself. In Job 14, 1, he said, Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Job even desired death. In verse 13 he said, If only you would hide me in the grave. But he ponders and he wonders. And in verse 14 he said, If a man dies... Will he live again? All the days of my heart service, I will wait for my renewal to come. I think it's the King James that says, for all of my days I would wait for my change to come. Job said, if a man died and could live again, I would wait for that change. The change that Job spoke about is the change that is the hope that sustains us. He asked, if a man die, will he live again? Really one of the great questions of all mankind. This is a question that's been pondered by many people in addition to Job. Is there life after death. 
Is there something more beyond this life? We know people begin life, they're born. We know they live their life, and then we know well that life ends. That part of the cycle is familiar to us. Birth, life, death. But is that it? Or is there more? People in all cultures and religions have struggled with that question and sought to answer it. And this evening, I too want to look at that question and examine what the Bible has to say in response to the question, if a man dies, will he live again? Before I even get into the message, lest you leave tonight with any doubt, let me answer Job's question clearly and emphatically. If a man dies, will he live again? Yes. If a man dies, will he live again? Emphatically, yes. I believe there is a life beyond this life. I believe with all my heart, death is not the final answer. For the Christian, that question has been answered emphatically by both the words and the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus clearly taught that there is life beyond death. Jesus clearly illustrated that when He died was buried, and was raised to life, establishing our hope as believers in this glorious hope of the resurrection. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to maybe the most familiar verse in the Bible, John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved, Our hope arises out of this amazing love God has for us. Our hope arises not out of our works, not out of our theories, but out of His amazing grace. Life is made possible because God loved us. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Life after death is made possible because God gave His Son. He gave His Son at the cross when Jesus died in our place. When Jesus paid the price for our sins. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish. This hope is ours when we believe on Jesus. This hope is ours when we trust and what He has done for us on the cross. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Some translations say, everlasting life. Those who trust in Jesus as Savior have been promised eternal life. But what does that mean? In the Greek, this says aeonius life. Aeonius is a form of the word eon, which is translated age. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus promises, I am with you always to the very end of the age, or aeon. The Bible speaks of this present age, and an age to come. Interestingly, both forms of the word and both references to the two ages come together in Mark 10, 29 and 30. Look at this verse, it's interesting. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, 
No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Aeon. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and field, and with them persecutions, persecutions, and in the age to come, the aeon to come. So Jesus recognized there's this present age, but he also said there is an age to come. This is very important to understand our hope. Now notice what he has, has to say. And in the age to come, eternal or aeonious life. So what Jesus is saying is if you have been faithful, if you believe on on Jesus, if you have been willing to leave everything to follow Him, you will receive blessings in this age, and in the age to come, you will receive the life of the age to come. Eternal life is really translated life of the age to come. When the Bible promises us eternal life or everlasting life, it is literally promising life in the age to come. That's what the Greek words are saying. So we go back to the question, if a man dies, will he live again? Yes, he will. But that life he lives will be life in the age to come. The last two verses of Hebrews 11. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what has been promised. Remember Hebrews 11 talks about all these wonderful people of faith. And he says they were all commended for their faith, but none of them received what has been promised. God had something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. All these people of faith will be made perfect at the same time that you and I are made perfect. And that time of our perfection is an event that has not yet happened. You and I will be made perfect. You and I will be given this gift of life in the age to come at the age to come. Look at the clear teaching of Jesus. Jesus said, My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, which is again, shall have life in the age to come, and I will raise Him up at the last day. What you and I have been promised is a life in an age to come, and that age to come life will be experienced when Jesus raises us up, and the time when He raises us up, He said, will be at the last day. You see, we have been given a hope of life beyond this life. We have been given to the question, answer to the question, if a man die, will he live again? But the answer is, he will live again when he is given life in the age to come. One more interesting conversation. Jesus had gotten the news that his friend Lazarus had died. And he goes to where Mary and Martha are grieving for their brother. And they are obviously shattered and in grief. And Jesus spoke to Martha. And he said to her, your brother will rise again. Now remember who Mary and Martha and Lazarus were. They were not just some people Jesus had met. These were people who were among Jesus' closest friends. Some of His dearest disciples. He had gone to their home and broken bread. He had stayed with them and visited with them. And they were familiar with His teaching. So Martha says to Jesus, I know He will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I have to believe that Martha was clearly feeding back to Jesus what Jesus had taught her. And what had Jesus taught her, uh, in answer to the question, if a man die, will he live again? Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
There was no doubt in Martha's mind what her hope was. Her hope was that Lazarus, her dead brother, would have life in the age to come, which would involve a resurrection at the last day. Now I suggest to you that if Jesus believed life after death involved something else, would this not have been the time for him to clear that up with his loved one Martha? Oh, Martha, 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 you silly ninny. Don't you know your brother Lazarus is up in the heavens right now enjoying a wonderful bliss? He and your mom and dad are probably sitting around sipping lemonade, remembering when you and Mary used to be silly little girls. Huh? Does Jesus say anything like that? Does he tell Martha you're all wet? You're all wrong? No. If that's what Jesus really believed, if Jesus believed that somehow at the moment of death you were released, released to some eternal bliss where you were experiencing life after death, this would have been the perfect time for him to have clearly taught that to Martha whom he loved, whom he viewed as a disciple. But he did none of that. He does not begin to try to correct Martha's clear statement. Look at it again. I know he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Instead, Jesus performs a wonderful miracle to show, indeed, who He is, the mighty Son of God. And He calls forth Lazarus from the grave. And of course, there's great rejoicing as Lazarus is restored to life. Not, not life in the age to come. He's given another chance at life in this age. But think about that for a moment. Let's suppose that Lazarus, upon death, had been released to eternal bliss and was enjoying his eternal reward and traipsing across the streets of gold, what a cruel thing Jesus did. Why would Jesus snatch him back from his eternal bliss if that's what was going on? No, Jesus taught and Jesus believed, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Because that will enter in the age to come, and then he will be given life in the age to come or eternal life. Jesus' answer to Job's question was very clear. Man will live again, but it will involve a resurrection and life in an age to come. The Apostle Paul built upon this clear teaching with clear gospel truths of what our hope is. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning with 13, verse 13, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Paul writes this to offer comfort to those who have died. Make no doubt about it. Death is an enemy. None of us like death. And death brings sorrow. Most all of us here have lived long enough to have experienced sorrow. I know this church has been deeply wounded by sorrow. But Paul reminds us, we sorrow, but our sorrow is different. Because we have a hope. And what does Paul go on to write? We have this hope that right now all those who have died are enjoying eternal bliss? No. That's not what Paul writes about at all. Read on. Verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. That is the foundation of the Christian hope. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Just as Jesus was resurrected, those who sleep in Jesus will be brought forth in a similar resurrection experience. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are alive and who are still left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with Him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That's our hope. That's our hope in a nutshell. Not that we'll die and be released to our reward. Our hope is in the return of Jesus Christ. Because it is at that moment that the trumpet will sound. It is that moment that the dead will be resurrected. It is that moment that the age to come will begin. And you and I will be given life of the age to come, or eternal life. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen? Paul said to the Corinthians, Then, at that moment, at the last trump, then will this mortal put on immortality. When will you and I have immortality? When will you and I have life in the age to come? At the return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead. If a man die, will he live again? Yes, he will. He'll live again at the return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead. You know, all the vivid descriptions in the Scripture of the streets of gold, the crystal fountain, the throne of God, the lion and the lamb lying down together, they're often in today's world termed heaven. But all of these are descriptions of the age to come after Christ's return. Heaven, as most think of it, is actually here on earth. The earth cleansed and made new at the time of Christ's return. You think about it, it's awful, really. If I thought I was going to spend eternity floating around on a cloud somewhere, I think I'd be miserable. You know, I could take about two or three days of sitting around doing nothing, and I'd get antsy. But to think that I can spend eternity serving God here on this earth, as one of His servants, doing what I love, hopefully I'll have a chance in the, in the kingdom to teach and preach, to help people, to encourage people. That turns me on. It's exciting to think I'm going to live in an age where there's not going to be all this garbage and sin and rotten stuff going on. Where I don't have to hear about child abuse, and I don't have to hear about divorce, and I don't have to hear about murder. And I don't have to worry about war. And I don't have to worry about injustice. And people treating each other horribly. To live in a perfect world where I don't have to hear the word cancer. And I don't have to worry about heart disease. And Maybe I'll even be able to eat red meat again. I don't know. But that's what I want. I want a very real life in an age to come. Real life here on the earth made new and cleansed. Revelation 5.10 says, We've been made to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God and we will reign on the earth. On the earth. That's our hope. If a man die, will he live again? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. At the return of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead, At that time, we will be resurrected to immortality and given the life of the age to come. Is it any surprise? The Bible ends with the prayer, even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come, Lord Jesus. That's our hope. That's what sustains us. You know, whenever I preach, I always ask my question, self the question, so what? So you believe that Eternal life is life in the age to come. So you believe in the resurrection of the dead. So you believe that that that's the time we're going to be given life in the age to come. So what? I think it has to affect your life today. And let me tell you how. First, we sorrow differently. Because we have a hope. Paul said, Brothers, do not, I do not want you to be ignorant of those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. 
Death is a reality that brings sadness. But the Christian knows that we don't ever say goodbye for the last time. The Christian knows we will meet again. The Christian knows that death is not final. The Christian knows that we're going to have all eternity together in the age to come. I don't pretend that sorrow doesn't hurt. I don't pretend that death isn't devastating. But I do remind you that we view it differently because we have a hope. Death, as vicious and as mean as it is, is not the final word. We will rise again. Let's hear another amen. We will rise again. I know you've lost some people you love in the last couple of years. And I know it hurts. But they will live again at the return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. And that hope sustains us. Number two, we not only view death differently, sorrow differently, but I think we live differently. We live differently. John wrote, Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what, we'll, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then he says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Knowing Jesus is going to return and resurrect those who are asleep in the grave makes me want to live my life differently. I don't know if your household is like mine and Gail's, but I suspect it is. You get a call and you somebody says, we're stopping over. What happens? Suddenly you go into the rapid mode and pick up the house, right? Because if friends come over, you want your house to look nice. If Jesus comes, don't you want your house to look nice? Don't you want to clean up some of the garbage in your life? We don't know when Jesus is coming, so we need to purify ourselves. Knowing our hope changes the way we live. We want to live to please Him, expecting Him, anxious for His return, keeping ourselves spotless, just as we try to keep our houses clean if we're expecting company. Peter writes, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. That's how I want Jesus to find me. Spotless, because I'm covered by the blood of Christ. Blameless, because I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. At peace with Him, because I've been reconciled to Him. Even so, come. And third, we better make sure that we're right with God. Paul, when he speaks of this hope, speaks to those resurrected to life in the age to come as the dead in Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection will be to those who belong to Christ. Do you belong to Jesus? Are you in Christ? John says it so clearly. He says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, life in the age to come. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you don't have this hope. You cannot answer the question, if a man die, will he live again, with the same emphatic yes. But you could. You could if you'll just trust Jesus as Savior. Because he who has the Son has life. If a person dies, will he or she live again? Absolutely. I believe that with all my heart. That if the person has accepted Jesus as Savior, the answer is yes. They'll live again at the return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. At that time, they're going to be given... Eternal life or life of the age to come. I believe they're going to live and reign with Christ here on this earth. 
and earth made new and cleansed and get rid of all the sin and evil and disease and harm in a perfect, glorious world. And we've been promised that hope. But let's remind us that hope is not based on how good you are, how well you've lived your life, but on whether or not you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. In November of 1963, John F. Kennedy was President of the United States. He was an extremely handsome man. He was president of the most powerful nation of the world. He was a very intelligent man. He had a beautiful wife, two darling children, and he had great riches. But that morning, on the streets of Dallas, when that rifle shot cracked, only one thing mattered. How are things between JFK and God? I don't care what you've done in life. The real question is, how are things between you and God? Because if you don't have the Son, you don't have that wonderful hope. I hope if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, that you won't put it off. That you realize today can be the day of decision. This can be the moment of reckoning. This can be the moment when you pass into that group that is in Christ. And say without any shadow of a doubt, if a man die, yes, we'll live again. At that glorious return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead. Even so come, Lord Jesus.